Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Cuccio, and I'm here with my colleague, Frederike Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Nick Dodson. He's the co-founder of CEO of, and CEO of Fuel Labs. They're building a fast modular execution layer. Before we talk to Nick, though, about Fuel Labs and get into all the details, let me t first tell you about our sponsor this week. Omni is your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet. Omni supports more than 25 protocols, so you can manage all your assets in one place across all major EVMs, layer twos, and non-EVMs. But what's really special about Omni is that you can do all the most important things in Web3 directly in the wallet itself. So you want to get yield? Well, Omni, Omni allows you to get the best APYs with zero fees and three taps. If it's staking, liquid staking, lending via Aave, or yield via Yearn, Omni lets you do it. If you need to exchange USDC for ETH on Atom or on Cosmos, Omni aggregates all major bridges and DEXs so you can bridge and swap across all supported networks in one transaction directly in your wallet. That's pretty cool. If you love NFTs, Omni offers the broadest NFT support of any wallet so you can connect and manage your favorite NFTs across all chains in one place. Omni is truly the easiest way to use Web3 and most importantly, Omni is fully self-custodial. That's really important, meaning that you never have to trust anyone with your assets other than yourself. If you want, you can even use Omni's ledger integration, which is also a cool feature, uh, so that all your funds stay on your hardware wallet. So join tens of thousands of users on this next generation wallet by downloading it today on iOS or Android at omni.app. Nick, thank you for joining us uh, on this week's episode of Epicenter. Um, yeah, uh, let's maybe start off by talking about your background. So you were previously at Consensus. I think you were one of the earliest employees there. Um, what was your role and uh, what kind of stuff were you building? Yeah, so um, first of all, yeah, thanks, thanks for, for having me. Um, yeah, Consensus, uh, I started... Initially, I didn't think I was early with consensus, although I did find out later on in time that um, I think it was like number 15 or 16 or something, something like that. Um, and initially, I was brought in to basically build out some early stage apps on Ethereum. So some of the first apps on Ethereum were, uh, you know, basically really simple things. I think there was one exchange and then there was something i was working on which was wayfund and, and another project called boardroom um so both those projects were um you know projects that consensus wanted to um you know kind of fund and help and and grow um so so i was working working on that uh, with them and then uh and then after that um you know started to work on some libraries and other things um you know, which are still used in you know, things like MetaMask and stuff like that. So um, also wrote a fair bit of infrastructure, did a fair bit of writing. Um, and yeah, that, that would kind of encompass consensus uh, for me. Um, you yeah, know, something like that. You then left consensus and you started Fewer Labs with uh, John Adler. Um, how did you meet and how did you decide to work together? Yeah, so John, I met in the Toronto office of Consensus. And um, initially he came, he came into the office one day and said that he had solved scalability for Ethereum or for you know, EVM-based blockchains, things like that. And um, uh, initially I felt like, um, who's the crazy guy in the office? Uh, so I'd heard so many times um, this kind of like rhetoric or <laughs> I, I've just heard, I've, I've heard it so many times that I didn't really uh, pay much attention to it, but um, you know, after I left Consensus and you know wanted to work on a few different pieces of infrastructure um, for Ethereum, some wallets, things like that, um, I started to think about what technology we had available for Ethereum to actually you know do scaling. And at the time, there was nothing like Layer Two or nothing like um, anything that we have now, Z zk even. It was very minimal, um, and uh, basically everyone was focused on payment channels or Plasma, uh, and those solutions weren't very good, and they were pretty subject to a lot of faulty kind of thinking or you know just technology that that wasn't great or wasn't well architected. So uh, I, I sent John a message and said, okay, you know, like what what was this stuff that you were working on? Uh, and then he basically described optimistic rollups to me, 
Um, and it was like a three hour conversation in the cafe back and forth, but it's pretty convinced at that time that this was something, um, you know, something worth working on, something worth spending some time on. Uh, so from that point, then we, we essentially started fuel, um, right there. So I was like middle 2019, something like that. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I mean, so fuel is a project that I haven't like followed very much, but I mean, like, I'm I'm now much more involved, I say, in the Cosmos space, and you know, Celestia has kind of captured the you know, captured the narrative, and like modular blockchains has really captured a lot of the narrative. I think in that space, I, I think in Ethereum two as well, with uh, with Ethereum two after the merge, now people are thinking about blockchains in a much more modular way. Um, but yeah, like, where does this all fit together, and? You know, in this modular stack of edu execution, settlement, consensus, and data availability, where does fuel sit, and uh, how does it interact with these other layers? Yeah, so I, I think to start with that question, um, I, I think it starts with just we like the the blockchain systems that we've been building. So so initially going from Bitcoin and then going into some of the the altcoins and then going into Ethereum. You know, we, I think the original designers didn't really know all the exact constraints or how things would actually play out with those architectures. So when you put them together initially, you're not so sure as to how you want to construct them. And that's going to create architectural issues. And because of, you know, the fact that blockchains are immutable and they, they work in a specific way, backwards compatibility is something that is very important to retain. And so this ends up kind of burying you in your decisions a little bit because you can't break backwards compatibility. So the decisions you make early on with the blockchain are the ones that you typically have to stick with for a very long time. And unfortunately for Ethereum, um, you know, Ethereum made a lot of um, very interesting and some really good design decisions at, at the early kind of, you know, stage of the project. But unfortunately, just due to its nature and due to the way that the architecture works, um, there was too many things that were designed uh, sort of not for scale. Um, and it ended up really hampering uh, Ethereum's ability to kind of get to scale. And I think across the ecosystem, whether it's like Cosmos or any other blockchain, all of them actually suffer from uh, a lot of processing issues that are really related to how much processing you can squeeze out of a, a node to process transactions. And so, um, we've only really over the past few years actually figured out ways to kind of better utilize the nodes and better utilize processing in a, in a blockchain setting or in a peer-to-peer -peer setting to actually resolve some of these scalability issues. And, and namely, parallel transaction execution for Ethereum is a big one. Um, and there's very few chains that actually try to address that or solve that. And that's just using all the threads and cores of your CPU to actually process transactions. And another one is just that the actual virtual machines themselves that we build smart contracts on uh, or we build smart contracts to target are also designed in a way that um, is very constrained and unfortunately is very, very expensive. And so the virtual machines we've typically used have not been flexible or not been cognizant of all of the sort of physics of processing that you typically see with blockchains. And blockchains are really weird machines because you need to price every operation. Otherwise, it's easy to bring the chain down. And when you're pricing every operation, this ends up creating a weird sort of physics in the design um, where, you know, you need to design for pricing of operations, not just necessarily low level operations or efficient operations. Everything has to be accounted for in that in that field. So when it comes to any one of these chains or any, any blockchain itself, um, typically you see similar physics play out and you need to design a system that's going to be tailored for that physic, um, or physics. Uh, but on top of that, when it comes to blockchains right now, I mean, there's probably thousands of blockchains out there. I think Cosmos, you know, and, and that ecosystem has been great in sort of addressing some aspects of blockchain, you know, scale or or, or, you know, basically getting blockchains to, to global adoption, which is effectively, you know, developing tendermint and these consensus systems. And, and I think a lot of their work has been extremely beneficial for, for that setting and as well also allowing 
other devs to create these sort of you know more case specific chains. I think for Ethereum, it's really just bringing us the ability to to do smart contracts and do kind of global settlement, um, even though the machine is is not nice to process and the system is not necessarily a great system for scale. Um, you know, I think with the advent of sort of layer two and how we're approaching execution now, we're sort of addressing that. And basically how I see things playing out in terms of the ecosystem, I think app specific chains are really important. Um, I think they can solve certain case specific issues with blockchain where you can get some benefits. I think Celestia solves this problem of who's watching the data and where, um, because you get that with, you know, state channel systems and other systems like that, where, you know, it comes down to for security that having a single source of data that a bunch of people are using ends up being a lot safer than spreading the data into different silos where it can just vanish. And then you can never actually run or challenge or execute a system in a, in a global, like peer to peer decentralized, like fault tolerant or censorship resistant way. So Celestia is really trying to address that in a, in a wholehearted way. And I think, I think it does a pretty good job. Um, and then I think as well, Ethereum does a pretty good job of just being a great settlement layer. I think the, um, kind of bandwidth increases we're going to see with like 4844 and stuff like that are going to are going to help a lot. But in terms of how I see all these things playing out, I mean, it's always really hard to say how the future is going to go. But already I'm starting to see that across the board, um, you know, we should not be so religious about how we execute things on blockchains um, because essentially these architectures are still very new and there's a lot of room to grow and improve. And so with fuel, we look to build an execution layer that can be extremely modular and fit into many of these different settings or be on top of different settings um, and be configurable in different ways. And so trying to maximize the amount of execution that blockchains can do in general and not trying to be ultra maximalist about like our own system or our own chain, but instead look at all these existing chains and go, well, how could we help someone like Gnosis chain or how could we help someone like a Cosmos chain or Tenement chain or Ethereum? How can we help them with their scalability goals, but also bring them a system that's complete um, from a scaling and DevX perspective and something that I think developers would be really excited to use and that really does address a lot of the scalability issues that we see in the space. So. Fuel is really trying to tackle execution and DevX um, as it's like core kind of thesis. And we're sort of letting settlement and data availability and things like consensus, um, you know, be dealt with by other systems. Um, and that's the way I sort of sort of see it. Um, Fuel will, will have many execution layers settling on Ethereum, probably some with Celestia's data availability, some with Ethereum. Uh, and some with no data availability, so like a committee. Um, and uh, I think I think that is an appropriate way to solve different projects' scalability needs while still retaining the Ethereum community and you know all the benefits that Ethereum brings to the table. Um, so maybe that gives you some answers. I sort of tried to walk through a bunch of different <laughs> topics there. So, um, so many so. answers, so many answers. Yeah, yeah. I have even yeah, more yeah. questions now. So um, <laughs> okay. there's there's certainly a lot to unpack here. So maybe um, before we kind of dive into the nitty gritty details about kind of, for instance, how you actually manage to parallelize transaction com uh, computation and so on, <clears throat> let's kind of look at the at the big picture, right? So basically, mm -hmm. if you have, if you have um, in the blockchain world, you have different functions that are kind of, um, uh, that are fulfilled um, traditionally um, all by, say, Ethereum. So, for instance, you, ha you had uh, data availability, consensus, settlement, and execution, and basically everything was done by, by, uh, by Ethereum. And now after the merge, I mean, basically, basically data availability, this kind of already, um, uh, there were pretty good integrations uh, even before the merge. So things like we, for instance, um, but uh, after the merge, we now have consensus and execution clients, right? And in principle, they kind of run independent of each other. Um, and then uh, you still have, you know, this extra execution layer on top of 
everything. And uh, basically, that's kind of like the world of L2s on Ethereum. So, and I mean, um, Fuel did actually start out as an optimistic rollup on the Ethereum, well, basically just that. Um, so what exactly does the pivot to a modular execution layer actually entail? So what 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 is that even? How is it different from an L2 if it then settles to Ethereum anyways? To me, that sounds like exactly the same thing. Yeah, so the distinction we make is that a lot of the layer twos in the in the space right now are not really designed for extremely high bandwidth um, systems. So they're really optimized for a different like a fundamentally different problem, which is really just trying to fit as many sort of transaction bytes onto Ethereum as possible. And the thing is, when you open up the data availability and when you just kind of look at a system with a lot more data availability, like Celestia, you really end up having to design a completely different style of execution system that is not necessarily, you know, one that like an EVM based system could ever accomplish, which is really trying to give you full like parallel transaction execution and trying to leverage all of that, that data or as much of that data as possible. So the distinction we make is that <clears throat> a modular execution layer is really designed for a high bandwidth um, system. So it's a distinction uh, from or away from layer twos, even though it can take the form of a layer two specifically and can take the form of like an optimistic role upon Ethereum. Um, it can also take other forms such as like, you know, validiums or other things that, you know, we, we've heard kind of discussions around as well. It can also be its own layer one, so it can be configured in many different settings. But the, the major distinction is that it's designed for a high bandwidth, you know, modular blockchain. And this is really one that you really only see currently with something like Celestia, but you'll probably start to see a little more of with Ethereum as they uh, try to expand their, um, their bandwidth. So we just make a distinction between modular execution um, and and, and layer two specifically just because we're trying to we're trying to leverage all the benefits that modular blockchains give us um, and high bandwidth is like a like a key aspect of that um, versus like a typical like layer two which is more optimized and designed for essentially trying to work on ethereum right now which is like trying to pack bits and bytes onto ethereum which is not necessarily a great optimization once you you know actually try to do you know, tens of thousands of transactions, that's like the least of your worries. Yeah. Do, do you think this is this assessment is going to change when we get, if and when we get dank sharding? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, for fuel and what we're trying to, to build, like we're looking to leverage all the data that we can on Ethereum as much as possible, just like any other layer two or optimistic rollup. But at the same time, we're also designing our system for extremely high bandwidth. That's far beyond what I think 4844 or, or dank sharding or, or any of these um, kind of upgrades would, would entail. Um, and that amount of data can be sig significantly larger. So um, whatever Celestia is going to pull off and as well, potentially even if we just wanted to run as a side chain, so we didn't want to use data availability on Celestia, um, we could open the bandwidth significantly. Um, so, you know, you have to sort of plan for like a, a lot of bandwidth and not just necessarily the bandwidth of like what Ethereum has or what Celestia has. So for us, it's just full parallel transaction execution across the board that allows us to capitalize on all of that. Yeah. If you're a developer right now and like you're, you're thinking of building an app, um, there, you know, there, there are any number of ways you could do that. Uh, and also like several different platforms and programming languages and ecosystems, but looking at, looking at it purely from a like stack perspective, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are the consideration one should uh, take into account when choosing uh, to, to go modular or like you, you've got this great uh, graph on, uh, on a blog post where You've got like on one side monolithic centric and and then uh, on the other axis or monolithic centric and, and, and modular centric on one axis and then you know, data availability consensus settlement and execution on the other and there's like you know six different ways that one can build you know on a, yeah. on a blockchain um, yeah what are the considerations that one needs to take into account when like wanting to choose 
whether to do like sovereign roll up or settlement roll up or like celestium, which I'm not even really sure what it is, or like validium or right. Know. Yeah, so I mean, I think the spectrum is always going to be between something like price, security, and 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 that's it. So you're you're basically in a situation where you're you're looking at well, how much does it cost for me to actually deploy and run my system, and then how much security do I actually need from the system, and and then finally, likely the case, where do I want assets to be able to settle to or be interoperable with, you know, at the at these sort of end stage, if if there is going to be a lot of assets there and as well what kind of ecosystems you want exposure to so with fuel we don't we're extremely agnostic to these variables um, you can deploy to a fuel execution layer that will be low in price uh, but potentially you know less security and then you can deploy to a layer that has a higher price point but also a higher grade of security and you can still have the benefits of settling on something like ethereum um, and having access to the Ethereum ecosystem via the fact that the, the bridges will interoperate with Ethereum, you know, very, very easily. But as well, if there's other chains, um, such as something like Gnosis chain or something else like that, where you're going to have execution layers as well, um, then, you know, execution can, can also happen there and you can also deploy to those systems. Um, and so or if it's Cosmos chains, or if it's layer ones using a fuel execution layer. So basically you get all the nice benefits and gradients of security, but you also get the guarantee that you can actually get to scale. You can get to the maximum amount of scale we can, we can get out of these systems. And that I think is something you don't get with typical EVM systems is have they really at the design stage, maximize the amount of processing and the amount of efficiency that you can get out of the system and also the kinds of things you can do with the system. So um, I, I would just say for a project, you're looking to deploy into fuel and you're looking to deploy into kind of this newer ecosystems, newer paradigm of thinking. Um, there'll be a few different execution layers for you to deploy to. <clears throat> and initially with fuel, we'll start with one but you'll have a, a gradient of options between price and security um, and settlement. And so I think it's giving developers a lot more options and granularity, um, which is going to be really, really important versus just having them deployed to some layer one over here or some layer one over there where effectively their app's just gonna go and die and they're not going to have the settlement or interoperability um, you know, characteristics that I think they would want for their application, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe let's go into the into the tech stack itself. So um, fuel um, as a system has the ability to kind of parallelize um, transaction computation. H how do you go about this? How do you make sure that you don't touch on the same uh, addresses uh, in different uh, parallelized threads? Yeah. So <clears throat> I, th I think the easiest way to break this down is just that when you're processing transactions, you would like to multi-thread. So you'd like to process different chunks of transactions all at the same time. Um, and I think this is like a really key differentiator benefit of systems that have been redesigned or systems like Fuel that can do this. But the core way that we achieve it is through UTXOs. So um, basically the UTXO model is what we initially set out to build with, with our first rollup uh, on Ethereum and you know what we still carry through today with our designs. And the UTXO model just allows you to um, basically notate, okay, these transactions are going to touch these areas of state and you can just statically analyze the blocks beforehand and you can parallel process them. Um, so this is something that has been a real struggle with EVM-based systems and Ethereum-based systems. Um, and uh, I think there are ways to address it, but because of the way the systems are architected, they're still not really well architected for this reality. And so <clears throat> even the benefits of parallelizing something like the EVM are minimal versus actually redesigning the system to be inherently designed for this property from the, from the get-go. I think you, you can see a lot more scale uh, potential. Um, but yeah, the simple, the simple answer is, is that every transaction just notates what it's going to touch in state. And then when 
you get that notation, you, you basically say, okay, well, we know these transactions are going to touch this, these transactions are going to touch that. So you can break that up into parallel threads and then parallel process it. And this allows us to retain verification times, um, uh, uh, verification times of the nodes such that, you know, basically nodes can retain something like a two week sync time, but still, you know, process tens of thousands of transactions, um, which is very important for just decentralization in general. Um, so you, you want your sync times to be lower. Um, so yeah, uh, that's kind of the, the crux of just our system and, and UTXOs allow you to accomplish that by just saying, okay, well, you know, every UTXO uh, is only spent once. And so, um, every time you spend either, you know, some asset or, uh, some contract, um, you, you basically just notate, okay, well, I'm going to spend this contract. So I'm going to interact with it. And then you're notating things like the, the state differentials or the block producer is notating those. And then that's it. It's a very simple way to accomplish it. And the reason why UTXOs are also beneficial here versus just doing an account style system <clears throat> is that with fuel, we actually don't have, um, we don't have global state routes and we don't have global account account routes and we don't need to reserialize those every time we process things. So this is actually a huge benefit when you get into the nuances of just processing um, blockchains in general. Um, and we can accomplish that because of UTXOs, because we know with UTXOs that every UTXO cannot be double spent. And so with these uh, inherent guarantees, you can basically start removing a lot of these big chunks of processing that we typically do with Ethereum nodes. Um, so there's significant advantages to using UTXOs without any UX downsides. So essentially you can still accomplish all the same things we do with Ethereum. There's be no downside or differential there at all um, for a developer. It's literally all upside. Yeah. Um, building like a smart contracting uh, platform on UTXOs is a lot more difficult than doing it on an account model though, right? So how much do you actually have to, what do you actually have to pay for gaining all this upside? So I would argue that, I mean, if you use Fuel right now, even with our, with our current SDKs, you'll notice that it, it's, it's no harder to use it than it is to use Ethereum. It's, it's actually... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Nick, I'm not, I'm yeah. not, I'm not yeah, talking yeah. about the, the, the dev. I'm talking about mm -hmm. the stack itself. So basically the, the right. cool protocol. Right. Yeah. I mean, basically with UTXOs, you're going to pay a little more on the data side, um, most likely, just because you're notating more stuff. However, if you wanted to accomplish parallel transaction execution with a standard model of just metadata, um, you'd still end up paying similar fees anyway. So the if we're talking about just what the downside of using UTXOs is, um, there's not many. It would literally just be that there's a little more data. Um, but again, the, the positive upsides are enormous. There's no global state tree, no global accounts route. Um, and these things get removed pretty quickly. So again, that just means that transactions are going to be cheaper um, and you're going to be able to process a lot more of them on a, on a normal machine. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. So, so okay. um, maybe let me, let, let me kind of reframe this. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, most early blockchains were UTXO based, right? So basically UTXO right. was the norm. Um, wh why did Ethereum opt for an account-based uh, balance model, um, and do you think if it were to be redesigned today or relaunched today, that would change? Yeah, so I think the core design behind just doing the accounts model was just that it was simpler and it was easier to reason about and manage. Um, and I think over time we learned, at least with processing, that these accounts models are actually pretty horrible to parallel process. Uh, if you're continuing to Merkleize every single account um, and have a root for, for every single block. So I think the original design decision was just that it was simpler and it was easier to reason about. Um, the, and the thing is, is like, you know, that's a totally reasonable decision to make at the early stages of Ethereum. However, I think given everything we know now and given how the UTXO systems work and, and how even current modern blockchains work. So if you look at Solana's design or Aptos and, you know, Sui design, um, basically we, we don't necessarily need to do it that way. Um, or if you do it that way, you basically lose something else, which is 
you either lose light clients or um, you lose uh, sort of processing benefits that you would get with UTXOs. And I think UTXOs give you really the best results. So I think if Ethereum was redesigned today, I think the UTXO model is still better um, in, in pretty much every way. Yeah, I think they would use UTXOs, let's put it that way. And by they, I mean just Vitalik and Gavin, yeah. Oh, I, I struggle to see Vitalik and Gavin get back together, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Fuel also has its own uh, virtual machine um, mm -hmm. that is distinctly different from the EVM. Um, mm -hmm. How is that so? Yeah, so basically, like we didn't, with Fuel, we didn't want to do any of this to start like, this whole project and a lot of it has been us basically going through <clears throat> the current state of the art architectures and just kind of the available architectures we have around us and really looking at what that is and, and how that works and going, okay, well, like, what do we, what do we have available? And um, unfortunately, you know, going through the way the EVM processes, the way that Solana and these other chains process and, and, trying to look at the properties that we wanted to achieve, um, we kind of realized that uh, doing our own VM would still give us the absolute best results for the developer and for blockchain in general, for the ecosystem. It would make the largest contribution to the ecosystem that we can make and be most beneficial. And so the Fuel VM is really, it takes lessons primarily from the EVM, but it also takes lessons from Solana, move chains, uh, Waza, MIPS, and some of those other architectures, uh, and basically tries to give you a blockchain virtual machine that is um, as close as we can realize to the kind of best blockchain virtual machine we can design as of today. Um, and the properties that we're aiming for there are essentially, you know, this physic of having to price every operation. That's a key one. Another one is retaining. Uh, like clients and another one is fraud provability so building a virtual machine that's actually easy to fraud prove on things like ethereum or things like solana so these are actually all key properties some of which are brand new that didn't exist before that we wanted to incorporate into this virtual machine um and so inherently um you know that that comes with the uphill battle of saying well we had to convince all these devs to use it However, the architecture really speaks for itself. And I'd say that devs that use it probably don't want to go back to anything else. And as well, they can see that because of the way that it's designed, it can exist in so many different places. So it can exist on different chains and in different settings as layer twos, as layer ones. It can really be an architecture we can use for blockchain for you know, many decades from now versus just trying to inch along existing architectures, but dealing with backwards compatibility issues. Um, and also, you know, using other runtimes that are fine, but they're not necessarily designed for light clients. And if you tried to make them light client friendly, these designs would fall apart. Like they would basically lose a lot of their processing benefits. So the designs we picked are inherently for trying to give the blockchain community the best possible virtual machine we can think of and build that in a modular way that's extremely reusable for everyone. So that's kind of the, the motivations. So, so for a, you know, a developer that, like a Solidity developer that's used to building on EVM or uh, let's say a Cosm Wasm developer that's building uh, on Cosm Wasm with Rust, uh, mm -hmm. what are gonna be the main differences uh, for, for like those two uh, developer kind of backgrounds and um, what are they going to have to learn in order to use this VM? Yeah, so the Ethereum devs will have the easiest time um, porting all their ideas over. It's very similar. It works in very similar ways to the EVM and we carry over a lot of the benefits of things like the state API um, or storage API and, and some of the ways that the EVM thinks about things. Um, to a Wasm dev, uh, or someone running on like, you know, a low level runtime. Um, it's basically going to be a little different in the sense that um, the VM itself has some key opcodes for things like managing uh, fungible coins uh, through UT our UTXO system um, and probably some other little key differences like 
certain opcodes we've added that are beneficial, super beneficial for doing resource constrained processing, which blockchains are resource constrained, um, but that actually have huge benefits because um, they're kind of like compound operations. So like a dynamic mem copy, for example, is something that like Ethereum desperately needs and I hope eventually it will get. Um, but uh, the, these kinds of operations are things that um, you know we've, we've added into the virtual machine. But basically the virtual machine itself has some really key differences from the EVM, such as the fact that it's 64 bit, not 256. It uses registers instead of a stack system. It has a different memory model. Um, our call model works in some similar ways, but in other ways can give you significant benefits because we have things like a shared global memory context. And so these little key differences end up being really, really helpful. Um, and you see Ethereum devs all the time trying to solve all these weird problems that only come up because of the shortcomings of the EVM. And really the right way to fix those things would just be to, to redesign the system and do something different um, and not and ignore backwards compatibility. Um, so just from an engineering perspective, we get to benefit from just saying, well, we'll bring over everything we like from all these systems and ignore backwards compatibility and just give you the best system we can possibly think of like today. Um, so that's kind of the way, way I would describe it or think about it. So you also say that um, you support multiple native assets. How is that different from Ethereum and who, what do you pay gas in and who determines what you pay gas in? Yeah, so on the front of multiple native assets, so so essentially our system and, and our machine is designed inherently to support basically treating native assets um, or assets that people create like native assets. So in Ethereum, you only have one native asset, which is just Ether. And unfortunately, Ether is the only one that gets really the benefit of low-level kind of client optimizations and things like that. So when you create tokens on Ethereum, you have to do them at the application or smart contract level. And that really hampers the amount of scale you can create uh, or the scale you can, you can kind of access because you're always kind of going back to the smart contract and affecting its state and re-serializing it. And it actually hampers a lot of the, the processing. So, so on our side, um, you know, we, we basically say, okay, well, any token can be uh, a native asset. So it can spit out this own kind of um, you know, token uh, that can be and live in the UTXO system. Um, and when you have that, it just allows you to do significantly more processing over the tokens um, because each token becomes kind of an atomic bundle that can go out of a contract and come back into a contract. And so when you have that, um, you, you get significant processing benefit, which means just ex like way lower cost. Um, really uh, on the, the state level, you're just doing one state right and that's it. Um, and again, there's no re-serialization and, and these sorts of things that we see with uh, current blockchains. Uh, it literally is just affecting one state right. Um, and so this just means cheaper transactions. Uh, it means cheaper transactions for you know, whether you're doing these like payments use cases or if you're just doing a lot of transacting in general, uh, it gives you all this sort of massive upside um, and it allows developers to tap into the native asset system. Um, and that's like a huge, huge benefit. Uh, it's something that Ethereum really desperately lacks because uh, every token you just end up creating an ERC-20. And unfortunately, that's pretty hard to scale when you really try to get into the, the crux of it. So, so that's one side of it. In terms of fees, so the chains that will settle on Ethereum will all have fees uh, in ETH. So like we're pretty uh, ETH maxi in that sense. Um, and there's crypto economic reasons for this, but it's also just that I think um, for us, like we look at fuel and what fuel is as a system, again, to, to help scale these other systems. Um, and so, you know, if we're deploying, uh, you know, these, these execution layers on, on Ethereum, it's likely the case that ETH will be the, the fee. However, you will be able to have things like private mempools and be able to accept you know, fees in DAI or USDC or, or these sorts of things as well, whatever the block producers want to, want to accept. Um, but in general right now, our, our current plan is just to, to use ETH as the, as the fees. Yeah. What's the learning curve for uh, like on the, uh, the like, so, so you know, Solidity is kind of inspired by JavaScript and right. you know, like what what is it but does the language actually look like? Is it, is it sort of similar to Solidity in this sense or 
Like yeah, so 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 Sway, our, our DSL, really looks like it, it looks a lot like Rust. So that would be the that would be the best way to describe it uh, is the, looking like Rust. Um, it inherits a lot of nice things from Solidity. It inherits a lot of nice things from um, you know some of these other kind of languages that we see in the space, but the predominant inspiration is still Rust. Um, and for a dev coming from Ethereum, I'd say the learning curve is pretty low. Uh, most Solidity devs can take a look at Sway and learn it in like a day or two. It's really, in fact, even a few hours, probably maximum. Um, because the language is a blockchain specific language or it's designed to target blockchains, it's not like learning Rust off the bat or these other systems languages. You're really getting a language that's, you know, very familiarized with all these concepts and, and you know, things that we typically do with blockchains. So a dev will feel very at home kind of using Sway. And I think currently we see that like most devs that come over, especially from Ethereum, they don't want to leave and even move devs really prefer it. Um, so we've already started to Sway pill a bunch of move devs as well. And then in terms of, in terms of Solana and what their experience is like, you know, basically they're, they're more in the Rust category and they're using Rust to target a lot of things. However, again, using a systems language to target a blockchain, as we've learned, is a horrible experience. Um, and even that goes for Wasm as well. And so with Sway, we really try to patch that up and say, can we give developers an incredible sort of blockchain development experience that feels like they have full control over the system and feels like the compiler is really designed for actually targeting blockchains. And in this case, specifically the fuel VM, but Sway will also be able to target things like the EVM in the future as well. How is fuel connected to the Ethereum or whatever the settlement layer is? Yeah, so the bridge that we have um, that we also recently released in beta two or a recent test network um, is sim very similar to Optimism, you could say. So there's a lot of inherited properties there to, to Optimism, some inspiration from Arbitrum as well. Um, so it's a generic like arbitrary message passing bridge, um, but you can basically bridge anything. Uh, you can bridge everything from uh, ERC 20s to 721s. You can do all sorts of arbitrary messaging in and out of the system. And basically, fuel, you know, gives you full settlements and you know the the properties that you're looking for as a dev to settle on something like, something like Ethereum. Um, but for any kind of token, so for example, if you wanted to create an NFT on, on on fuel, have it massively scalable, mint you know millions of them, and then have some of them be able to come back onto Ethereum and settle, uh, you could do that. Um, you can also just take USDC and die and these other things, put them over the bridge, and they become native assets uh, in fuel uh, and can benefit from our UTXO system. So essentially, we get to fully interoperate with Ethereum liquidity. And, um, and you know, and that goes for, for NFTs and for fungible tokens. Um, so that'd be the best way to describe it. Yeah. Okay. And what about the nodes that actually run fuel? So who runs mm -hmm. those? Yeah, so currently we're starting out with a single sequencer model, so similar to, to Arbitrum and Optimism, um, you know, with some, some fallbacks. That's mainly just to get everything set up and, and to allow devs to, to actually get to production. Um, after that point, though, um, you know, we will actually look to decentralize block production. And um, this is like a key piece of our architecture. And in decentralizing block production, what we mean is, is being able to have many different block producers, not a single sequencer, but you still get to benefit from all of the nice upsides of things like layer twos and optimistic rollups. Um, so you get a essentially like a decentralized sequencer, you could say. Um, and the way that we accomplish that is really through a tenement like system. However, you get all the upsides of Tenement and not the downsides, which is that the security of the system is typically taken care of by Ethereum itself and data availability being secured on something like Ethereum or something like Celestia. So um, you, you basically get to do everything you really want with a, with a blockchain. You get to have all the nice properties that you're looking for, and you don't really have very many downsides. So that's, that's kind of where we're headed with that. Yeah. I want to take a step back a little bit here, and, and uh, we, we talked about bridging just brief, previously here. Uh, 
what does that what what does bridging look like uh, in a modular stack ecosystem or uh, application? Uh, it, does does bridging happen at the application layer, at the execution layer, or does it happen at lower layers in the stack? And the other question I have is, you know, more broadly, I, I think that um, one of the biggest challenges right now is uh, creating trustless or trust minimized bridging standards across different ecosystems. So, you know, right. you know the, the Ethereum EVM ecosystem has you know, solutions for bridging uh, across EVM chains. Um, you know, Polkadot has also their own protocol. Uh, Cosmos has their own protocol. I'm not quite sure what's happening sort of like in Solana and other ecosystems. I think probably Avalanche also has like, uh, 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 I think they do have a bridging protocol that leverages ST uh, SGX. Uh, you know, as as these chains become more modular, and you know, some might be using the like EVM execution, and others might be using like I don't know Wasm, but they're all using like the they're, they're all sharing data availability and maybe sharing consensus or sharing some other layer. Um, how, how do we reason about creating standards here that allows these chains to interoperate? And does the modular stack facilitate this interoperability? Yeah, so I, I think with bridging, you have you have a few different kinds of bridging here. So one being just bridging that, you know, we typically see with just having an execution layer bridge to something like Ethereum. So, you know, a bridge that we've seen with, you know, Arbitrum or Optimism, that, that kind of setup. Um, and those bridges are are more about, I would say, settlements. And and as well, we, we use them for, for different aspects of like block production and posting headers and things like that. There's other bridges, though, that you want um, you want some key properties if you really want to achieve trust minimized bridging. So some nice properties that you get with modular blockchains um, or with blockchains or execution layers that share the same data availability is that uh, each execution layer can introspect each other. So basically um, you can introspect from one layer, you can say, what is the headers and the state of this other layer? And if you can do that, you can create um, these trust minimized bridges where essentially instead of having like a multi-sig on both sides, you can actually have just smart contracts on both sides uh, of, of, the, of the bridge. Um, and so let's say you were bridging from one fuel instance to another fuel instance on Ethereum. Because both of these layers have the same data availability and they have the same, um, you know, uh, uh, headers, um, or, or they have an easy to introspect, um, you know, block header system, you can basically create a trust minimized bridge between the two of them. Um, and it's trust minimized because you're not really relying on necessarily things like multi-sigs uh, on both sides. And so this gives you some huge benefits when you're actually moving and bridging liquidity um, between these execution systems. Um, so that, that would be one way to, to describe it. If you're building execution systems on, on Celestia, it would be the same. So, you know, you, you basically, you share uh, data availability. And so, you know, one execution layer can actually introspect the other. Um, and that's like a very key property with trust minimized bridges that I think will be a huge game changing sort of factor for why you would want to pick a modular blockchain versus just picking these layer ones, because we've already seen so many bridges fail with multi-sigs that, you know, really, uh, if we're going to continue to build newer newer blockchains, you're going to want these properties in your blockchains um, so that you can actually interoperate all the liquidity. Um, it also works well for upgradability. When you're doing a new execution layer and you want to move things over, you can also, you know, move, you, you, you can introspect the previous state. You can also move assets and liquidity over. So some really key properties there um, that are really nice. Yeah. And, for for chains that are applications that are using different data availability layer, and I think I guess like that's kind of like the bottom layer in the stack. Are we going to need like interoperability between data availability, like you know Ethereum data availability and Celestia, and I don't know like what other data availability layer? Is that really where like if if chains start, if the ecosystem starts moving towards this more modular stack, and there are kind of data availability monoliths, um, right? Are we going to need to have like some bridging between these data availability layers, or can they uh, validate each other? 
Yeah, I mean, ideally you would want them to interoperate, but then you have basically potentially different different layer ones trying to interoperate with each other. So you, you're still going to inherit the same sort of fail, failure properties of sort of typical bridges between layer ones. So I would say that the real benefit comes from bridging between execution layers on the same layer one is going to be the, the best possible thing you can do. So like, you know, uh, if systems like Arbitrum and Autism actually had better decentralized sequencing, then you could you could have a lot of nice guarantees between bridging between those execution layers and something like Fuel uh, if it was deployed tomorrow on, on Ethereum because Ethereum would be the shared data availability and execution layer, you know, in, in, that, in that case. Um, and so I would just say that, yeah, you still have the same failure points um, if the... Uh, it, 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 if essentially they, they're, they're separate layer ones. Yeah. So still the same problem. How does this translate into ecosystem? So there's currently only a, um, a test net out, but who, yeah. who are the people building on fuel? Yeah. So right now I'd say we have like a small kind of following of projects. Our current philosophy with fuel is that um, we really don't need thousands of projects to build on fuel. We need only like 10 good ones. So for us, like we don't care about having 500 NFT rug bull projects on our system. It's not really anything we need or care about or that benefits anybody. Um, the projects that we currently have building on fuel, we have, we have a few DEXs, a few NFT systems, and then a few uh, lending systems. And I would say that the key differentiating things about them are going to be that they can leverage <clears throat> sort of things like fuels account abstraction, or they can leverage like parallelization. Um, they can leverage some unique properties about the fuel VM or about Sway, um, about having a significantly larger amount of memory uh, available at computation time. And just like uh, all these little key details will allow them to create a highly differentiated product from or, or system than what you typically see with EVM systems. Um, but it'll still be accessible to people with things like MetaMask wallets and, and Ethereum volume. So that's really the best part is the accessibility is still with Ethereum and, and all that sort of stuff. It's just all that underlying architecture allows you to do way more. Um, so that would be the way that I would describe it. Um, like some some notable names are like Elix and Pool Sharks and, uh, and, and Unic as well. Um, and I'd say a lot of the projects that are building on fuel are far more ideologically or philosophically aligned to, I think, the values of building these kinds of centralized systems um, and building something that is actually fundamentally unique and not something that is just going to be another, like, I don't know, just another project or a copycat project. Yeah. Cool. So what's the roadmap look like? So when mainnet? Yeah, so I'm sort of hesitant to give a date for mainnet, but um, I'll preliminarily say that uh, there's two test nets until something will happen. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we just need to do about two more test nets. And then I would say that we're you know, in a pretty good space to um, you know, be actually going to, going to mainnet. Um, and you know, I, I would say it'll, it'll be probably another two quarters, something like that. Um, if, if I were to, to guess, um, but that, that would be my, my somewhat alpha drop there. Uh, yeah. Uh, however, I, I will say that with fuel itself, like everything you would want to build, you can build right now, uh, over the test nets. So everything's still being kind of scaffolded and put together, but, um, you can basically build anything that you would want right now anyway. So, um, don't hesitate to actually start investigating fuel and, you know, building stuff with it. Yeah. If you're a project. <laughs> so so, so wh where can people come and find out more about Fuel and get started? Yeah, so you can just start with fuel.network. So uh, er everything's available through that. Um, that's where you can find all of our docs. Um, and basically, we, we've got a ton of like, uh, you know, great tutorials, uh, guides, etc. 
Um, we're always looking to improve the docs, so that's like an ongoing thing. Um, just the, the docs improving. are excellent. I went yeah. through them oh, last yeah? night, okay. and they, yeah, they they are excellent. I took I took several notes for for our own docs. So yeah. amazing, amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we still there's still even more we can do. So it's uh, we'll, we'll continue to increase the the docs and and as well just everything across the board. So we're we're in taking as much feedback as we can from devs because we have a unique opportunity here to build a, a, a system that I think devs actually would really like to use um, and that gives them everything they need. Um, so like that, that's going to be very key for us. Uh, and it allows us to differentiate in a big way from existing tool chains that have had to sort of learn the hard way how to build a lot of this stuff. So, yeah. Cool, fantastic. Uh, I'm excited to see how this will go and how long the two test nets will take and uh, to see this in action. Awesome, amazing. Thank you, Nick.